I did this right, we're live. <clears throat> hey, we're alive. We're live. We did it. Hello. We... Hey. Hello, world. <sighs> All right. Now's your chance, everyone, uh, to say hello to me and uh, and the team in the chat, and then we will uh, we will get on with the uh, with the show, and I'll get a chance to say hello to everybody. Hey, Fraser. Okay. <laughs> Um, there we go. Yeah, we've got some confirmation of our existence. So someone has collapsed the wavefront. Oh, all yeah, right. We've been observed. Um, That's where my antimatter person went. You have an antimatter person? Yeah, it doesn't everybody. Yeah. So, is that a weird thing? No, no. Just I, me? No, no. We all have these experts on standby. Hmm. Um, well, not anymore. <laughs> someone... Made a great comment on Twitter today that I thought was just perfect. That one of the downsides of being, or one of the advantages of being a journalist, is you get a chance to talk to um, space scientists for like half, or astronauts, or administrators for like half an hour, and it's like a private lecture. So cool for like half yeah. an hour, and yeah. you're just like, this is the greatest thing ever. I wish other people could hear this. Yes. And and then you you know madly transcribe it or figure out a way to make your robots Recording. transcribe it. <laughs> yeah. Recordings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and I've tried. I've tried taking just like live transcriptions. That does not work yeah. for me. Yeah, I especially if it's it an after. hour long. Yeah. It's an hour long. Yeah. 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 And yeah, so was... I've switched to try to get as many of the things that I do just broadcast live on the internet, as opposed to. Uh, you know, having them like instead of me interviewing somebody for some article that I'm working on, I'll just broadcast the interview and then and then maybe work on an article or maybe just not. So yeah, but yeah, it's it's one of the be the best advantages of this job. That's it's, true. I yeah. think one of the most fascinating interviews I ever had was the uh, with the head of the ESA space debris office. Yeah. Ooh. So like the people in charge of navigating the satellites around all the junk. Uh, yeah. and figuring out how to get rid of all the junk and it just like hammered home how much I don't realize like there's just so much trash up in space yeah. and how often these like collisions and near collisions happen we just don't hear about it yeah you know yep hello to Andy Cowley Astro B Bill Sugden David Dunn David Fairweather Giselle Sabarin Grant Lanning Johnny J Johnny Zed Yorn Albert Kim Barron Larry Beckham, Martin Bradshaw, Nancy Graziano, Paranor, PsychoCat749, Raza Siddiqui, Rick Schwartz, Scott Bragdon, Sergio Botero, Tom Van Scotter, Tori Gadwa, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey, everybody. Thanks for saying hello. Uh, oh, good. Nightbot is working, so we're safe. Um, all right. Uh, another minute or so, and then we'll go. Um, just in case people uh, don't have anything to do on Friday, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Dr. Robert Zubrin, uh, 10 a.m. on uh, my YouTube channel, which is going to be uh, interesting. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to be doing Astronomy Cast on Friday afternoon at noon Pacific. Uh, and then on Monday, uh, I'm going to be chatting again with uh, Sean Carroll. So we're going to be talking about quantum mechanics in his new book, something deeply hidden, which I'm a little, I'm a little worried about because it's kind of like having a conversation with Gandalf, uh, about magic and, you know, trying to wrap your head around. And then perhaps Saruman has some concerns with Gandalf's treatise on magic is the is the gist that I'm getting and I need to somehow And in the meantime you play Magic the Gathering. Yeah, or whatever. You know, it's all just magic to me. Quantum mechanics. I mean, you know, anybody who says they understand quantum mechanics doesn't understand quantum mechanics. And I do not gonna say that I understand quantum mechanics. So it's gonna be an interesting interview. I think it'll be fun. I think Most... the Zubrin one will be good too. The Zubra one will be fun. Um I think it's going to be um it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a little contentious because yeah, you should. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, I hope you ask him his opinion on the, uh, on the gateway. Oh, <laughs> that, well, that's it. He, he has opinions about a lot of these things. So I think it's going to yeah. be a lot of fun. Um, you know, they are, uh, toll booths, I believe he calls them. So yeah, I believe. And anything that isn't just jamming humans into a spacecraft and sending them to the surface of Mars is, you know, is not the best idea. 
So, uh, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Wait, is that what he's saying is the best idea? He's always thought that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, just, yeah. just pile humans into a rocket ship, send them to Mars. They don't even need to come home. It's the spam in a can approach. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Get humans to Mars. Yeah. So, um, All right. Yeah. To yeah. so each their own. Yeah. No, I think, I think, you know, Elon Musk's plans to, like, have humans come home again is uh that's ridiculous yes yeah no, no yeah that's just ostentatious that's unnecessary no do that. but but i mean uh zubrin's plans defined a generation of thinking about mars uh i'm not gonna lie hmm. completely inspired my entire career to read his book and right. and inspired uh, uh elon musk and and jeff bezos as well so i think it's uh it's difficult to you know, because now here we are with all these toll booths. I'd love to hear sort of what his current thinking is, and I'm sure I will. All right, uh, let's move on with the actual show that we're in here. There's you guys. There's me. Uh, here. Got to make sure all of the numbers are right. So I get my intro right. All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, September 25th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, an update on Chaos, uh, ESA's new uh, planet hunting mission, uh, how to feed a million people on Mars. Uh, the Milky Way, the black hole at the heart of the Milky Way is getting hungrier and hungrier, and the research that Venus could have supported life for billions of years. Joining me this week, we've got on my screen, you ready for this? Everybody, she's back. Yes. Hello. No. Oh. Kimberly Cartier. <laughs> oh. Hello, also, Fraser. Happy <laughs> podcast day. Oh, I just, he was, you, she was on my screen, was ready to go. <laughs> you stole my podcast day thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Happy podcast day. Happy podcast day, everyone. Welcome back. Kimberly, Thank it's great you. to see you. And Good to be back. Um, and Kimberly, of course, is a reporter for EOS magazine. And space scientist, exoplanet uh, specialist. It's great to have you back. Uh, we've got the space writer, Carolyn Collins-Peterson. Carolyn, Hi, welcome Fraser. back. Hey, how are you doing? And man, it's so great to have you like twice in a season now. So you're going to be like a regular, which is, oh. which is great to have you kicking around. Um, Glad to be here. And we've got back for her second shot, a PhD student at Columbia, Moya McTeer. Moya, welcome back. Good to be back. You didn't kick me off after the last time. No, no. I think we're going to put more responsibilities onto your shoulders. <laughs> Great. Looking forward to it. So the only problem is you're quieter than everybody else. So the screen oh, never no. switched to you. So I'm not sure if there's a way that you can increase the gain or just yell. I can. I can. Tr I'll. I'll try to increase the gain. If that doesn't work, I'll just be really loud. Perfect. Yeah, I promise you cannot be loud enough compared to the uh, to the other people. So uh, that's perfect. Uh, all right, and of course we're going to get into our uh, into our special interview in a moment. But I realize that I have forgotten for the last couple of weeks to do a big shout out and a thank you to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are, of course, the uh, symbiotic relationship that we have with our fans. Uh, unlike regular fan bases, they are the executive producers of the show. They organize everything behind the scenes. They decide who our guests are going to be. They tell us who to talk to. We really just show up and do as we're told, and we wouldn't have it any other way. So if you want to be a part of this amazing community, uh, go to uh, wshcrew.space and they will give you all the information to be able to uh, to, to get connected. Um, and a huge thank you like to Nancy Graziano, of course, who has been going out of her way to organize this new format with all of the new, uh, you know, with this sort of ever-changing crew of, of space journalists. Uh, she has gone, she's been working really hard to keep everything organized, and we really appreciate it because I think it's just great to be able to get as many voices to be able to communicate the space and the science. And uh, instead of us just uh, resting our laurels, uh, she's uh, we're, we're mixing it up. And I think it's just great. So uh, Nancy, uh, if you're watching, thank you so much from me, 
all of our co-hosts and everybody who is, uh, I hope listening and watching, you are the best. WSHcrew.space. All right, let's get on with the interview portion. Now, Aaron, you could say hi. Hi, yes, sorry, I was very confused before. <laughs> so it's no problem. Uh, Great. I, uh, I perhaps should have, don't worry about it. You know what, it all worked out. We're all okay. professionals here. Uh, we all got this, yeah. we know what we're doing. I'm, I'm sure anyone who is listening to the show will just mentally edit in a way that when they think back fondly on this episode, it went perfectly without any flaws whatsoever. So That's um, amazing. There's actually two of you here, uh, yes. you and your brother. Who are you, what do you do? Aaron, you can uh, go do first. you want to go first? I'll let Aaron go oh. first. Oh, yeah. I'll go first. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Aaron Lockman. Um, I work at the Adler Planetarium at uh, in, in Chicago, where I'm a Sky Show narrator. Um, I am also an actor and a playwright and a theater critic. I do a lot of uh, writing about Chicago theater and theater communication. Um, and uh, and I'm also a podcaster, obviously. Uh, and this guy, this guy over here, uh, we do uh, the Astronomy Brothers podcast. Indeed, it's and, like uh, uh, yeah, like car talk for spaceships. Yep. <laughs> and uh, now I uh, and I I apologize in advance. I haven't actually listened to the show, but it's you guys have just gotten started. I just uh, yes. checked out the the podcast, and you've got one show in the can already, which I think is half the game right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, uh, we both have experience with that sort of thing. Uh, Aaron is really the podcaster, um, but I had a radio show for four years, a panel radio show uh, that I ran. Actually, I walked away from that to take my current uh, position as the communications director of Blue Shift Aerospace. It's a, a startup we're working on a, on a bio-derived rocket fuel here in Maine. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I do by day. And, uh, and by night, I podcast. I'm, I'm back in it. <laughs> Right. Um, and I think that's great, right? Like you, one of you works at the Adler Planetarium. One of you is an aero. Are you an aerospace engineer? Uh, no, you work I'm as, more as a communications the... director, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, to bring that conversation together. So tell us about the podcast. You, yeah, you, you do it. You go first. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, Aaron. I'll just uh, call you by names and, and ask you the question. I'll, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll smooth this up. Sure. I, I guess growing up, I was always a little bit more the the space nerd. Um, but then, yes, <laughs> <laughs> to to an extreme. Who extent. works at a planetarium? Um, anyway, <clears throat> well, Aaron does. But I've actually worked and turned or volunteered at every planetarium in Maine. Right. So. I see. Oh, of course you have. Of course yeah, you have. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, no, but it, it's because when when we were growing up, when we were little kids, Seth was the shall we say the more extravagant space nerd. He was really into it, and I was just kind of tagging along. Um, but it wasn't until, uh, I was an adult that I was just, I needed a day job and they were hiring at the planetarium, uh, in Chicago where I was going to college at the time. And, uh, I got hired there and I just sort of, sort of rediscovered my own, uh, passion for, you know, learning and talking about space, um, sort of out from under Seth's wing. Uh, as an as an adult, uh, and then and so we've kind of come full circle because uh, we realized that uh, when when was this last year we were talking? Yeah, because um, because we we were talking shop. It got to the point where we were starting to have yeah. arguments about various aspects of space travel on the right. phone. Oh, like and you know what it was? I was on your radio show briefly. Uh, yeah, you did come on the show one time when you came to visit. And we <laughs> talked about communicating science at the planetarium. Exactly. Mm. And, and I remember when we were done recording the radio bit, we recorded like a, a bit of extra audio and we, we just talked about like IO for like 20 extra minutes. Yeah. Uh, and then when we were wrapping up, I was like, I turned to you and I was like, Hey, you know, I feel like we could sustain this. I, I was mentioning just before the show started that, you know, one of the great advantages to being a space journalist is that you get to just have these amazing conversations with people who work in the field. But even just like when I think about people talking shop and just talking about the ideas, that's absolutely fascinating to listen to as well. Why not? If you're already going to have these fascinating, wide ranging conversations from a place of knowledge, why not turn on an audio recorder and, uh, and have people listen to that? Uh, so for people who maybe want to start catching up to what you're doing, what is the format of the show? Um, well, the good news is there's not too much catching up to do just yet. Um, 
the the format of the show is uh you know we, we talk about um space news and then um aaron maybe you can describe uh, what a space old is by contrast <laughs> yes so, so we, old. we divide each episode into sections first we have uh space news where you talk about all the you know new new stuff that has happened since the last episode uh, and then we have a space olds uh and that can just be any sort of uh any sort of topic that we want to dive into. Um, so for instance, our upcoming episode, I am fascinated by the Kuiper Belt and I want to do a whole space olds section about the Kuiper Belt. Uh, um, and so we'll talk about we'll talk about Pluto and its demotion from planethood. We'll talk about uh, you know how Maya and and Sedna's weird orbit and um, and and you know of course the hypothetical planet nine. Um, uh, so like space olds, space olds is any, um, is any sort of, uh, obscure science, uh, well, not necessarily obscure, but something that's not widely known, obscure science fact that we like. Uh, and then and, we have a section and perhaps, called- perhaps a little bit of like on this day in space history as well. Yeah. Something like that. Um, and then, uh, our next section is called the sci-fi quibble. Uh, and that's when we take a moment in science fiction or popular culture, uh, can be a movie, a book, or a TV show, or whatever, and we just sort of deconstruct it. Uh, for instance, our, la our, our most recent episode, our first episode, we did a, a space quibble called uh, Is Asgard a Planet? Because <laughs> um, it's really unclear. Uh, it's really unclear in the Marvel Cinematic Universe whether it's, it's a whole thing. I have a whole rant about it. You can go and listen to it. Is it a city? Is it a planet? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Right, because when you, when they zoom out, it looks like it's on this weird flat asteroid. Anyway, we don't have to get into it right now. <laughs> but you'll get into it in the next episode of the podcast. Oh, we did. Uh, we, we got into it in the in the most recent one. Oh, okay, so you can, right. you can go and listen to that. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For yes. the uh, for the next episode, we're going to look at the depiction of a of a gravity slingshot in episode one of Another Life on Netflix. Oh no. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's funny. In fact, it literally after that gravity slingshot was when I stopped watching that show in disgust. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, Great. Yeah, and said, "Nope, I'm in the, I've had enough." Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, we we alternate. So I I got to pick the sci-fi quibble for the first episode. So Seth gets to pick this one. Yep. And uh, so so then we have a couple other segments. The the 101 where we cover some basic. Uh, aspect of either the scientific process, something like um, predictive power versus explanatory power, or something like, you know, what is an orbital inclination? Uh, and then we have the pale blue dot moment, which is kind of a philosophical soapbox. And we won't necessarily oh, I, go through every single one I thought one it was called the, Sorry? I thought it was called the soapbox. Ah, the soapbox, which is oh. a pale blue dot moment, yes. Right. Planning right. as yeah. we go. Very well. Yeah, no, clearly. Yeah, so we don't necessarily, you know, insist on hitting every single segment in an episode. Um, and, uh, oh, and then we got incoming transmissions, you know, once we start getting uh, listener feedback, we have plans to, you know, kind of start a conversation a little bit. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. All right, so uh, so where can people find Omore? Yeah, so uh, I think the, the, the most populated part of the internet that we're on is uh, our Facebook page. So uh, if you just look up, the Astronomy Brothers or uh, Astro Bros Pod, that would be how you find us. Yeah, and I think if you search for the Astronomy Brothers, uh, it comes up on Stitcher, iTunes, all of the places where good podcasts. Yes, are found. we're on iTunes. Uh, right now, we're on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. We're trying. Uh, we're in the process of branching out and getting on all uh, all those other places as well. Um, but yeah, and I believe on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, we're also at Astro Bros Pod. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, Aaron and Seth, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. And of course, by coming on the show and planning out the future, you now are going to be unable to pod fade and will be with us for years. So definitely come back, uh, you know, as the as the hundreds start to rack up uh, in your in your uh, library. Thank you oh, so much. From your mouth to God's ears, my friend. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll hold you to it. And let me know if you ever need a guest on your show. I, I will go anywhere. So we would love to have Great. you right on. I'm there. Just let me know. All well, right. Thanks guys. And, uh, and we'll put a link in the show notes so people can find out more and, uh, and give it a listen. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. 
All right, uh, time to move on to the news portion of this week's episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. And I'm going to, it's just been so long, Kimberly. Tell us the news. Hey. So before I get to the news, I just want to say there was, I had a an astronomy in the media and in TV show moment just like yesterday. I was rewatching West Wing and I forgot that there was one episode where they talked to the NASA scientists and it was simultaneously cool and depressing because they were like, oh yeah, we're looking forward to the James Webb Space Telescope launching soon. And oh, we're gonna go to, we're gonna put humans back on Mars soon. Yeah. And and then it segmented, it segued into uh, amateur astronomy moment that I don't think would actually work. I don't think there's any particular time of year where you could observe all the objects that they did, but it was simultaneously cool and like, ugh. What did they, anyway. wait a second, what did they observe? Because you, Okay, so maybe the an, amateur astronomers can correct yeah, me, this, but they gonna... went from Jupiter with all four Galilean moons no problem. visible e easy to peasy. the full Orion Nebula to Mars to Saturn. So you... Can all of that happen? Yes. All at once yep. from Washington, D.C.? Yes. Oh, well, I was wrong. Yeah, the Orion Nebula might be a little bit... Today. So we would have to go oh, back and but, think about yeah. the date when they shot yeah. that episode because... Sometime in the 90s, I guess. Yeah, so... Um, so anyway, yes. when, when they mentioned in their podcast, oh, yeah, we go through TV shows and movies about sci-fi. And I was like, I had that moment. Yeah, I'd have That's to go cool. back and look at where Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars were. Yeah, some one of the amateur astronomers, someone yeah. who, who does more observing than I do, please tell me if yeah. you can do all these things with a standard backyard telescope. You absolutely can. All at one time it, but, in D.C. In fact, last please summer, <laughs> you could see... Um, all six planets, all six bright planets, uh, including the Earth, at the same time in the sky. While Orion was up? Not while Orion was up. It was in the well, summer. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't know, Fraser. The plan okay, you might not know this, but exoplanets and, and regular planets go around their stars. Do they really? Yeah. Yeah, I don't Wow. So, uh, Comple that's completely new information. I know, I know. You, you maybe it may just like make you go back and take another look at your doctoral thesis. Um, but yeah, I know it's I'm a, never looking at that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, so uh, the key is just, I mean, Saturn's the tough one. Uh, okay. because Saturn takes whatever, I don't know, 13 years to go around. Well, if someone, if someone in the years? comments can pinpoint yeah. exactly what yeah. time of year that episode had to have been filmed. Yeah, that's for awesome. Somebody's doing happen, it right now. But the episode do. where Let they have know. the, was it the one with the space shuttle where the space shuttle doors were open? They no. couldn't get them open and the thing was this overheating. Is, oh, this is great. a couple seasons later. Yeah. That, that with the space shuttle. That was great. Too. Anyway. Yeah. No, they, I, I uh, wish there was TV shows that handled that as, as well. So. Anyway, exoplanets, you mentioned exoplanets. Yes. I kind of like Chaos. those. In, ca in case you knew that, I, I like exoplanets. Um, and we, there's been a lot in the media, obviously, lately about TESS, which is an excellent exoplanet mission. But there's another exoplanet mission coming up in just a couple of weeks, potentially. Uh, and it's the European Space Agency's first exoplanet mission. It's called the Characterizing Exoplanets Satellite. Very straightforward. Pronounced Chaos, I have learned. Uh, I was pronouncing it wrong this whole time. Me too. <laughs> uh, until I learned. Yeah. Um, and what it is, it's essentially a very high precision exoplanet follow-up telescope. So it's not so much for the broad net, uh, a, a casting a wide net, observe you know hundreds of thousands of stars at a time and see what we see, like Kepler and K2 and TESS. It's very much a uh, precision targeter exoplanet follow-up. So it's observing bright stars where we already know that there is a transiting planet and its job is to essentially nail down all of the parameters that it can so that we can actually start to figure out what these planets really are because when you're measuring a, a an exoplanet transit and trying to use that to figure out how big your planet is the biggest error that you have that you always have is what size is your star uh, because everything that we measure with exoplanets is relative to the star itself. And with transits, that means we're measuring the planet size relative to the star's size. And if you don't know the star too well, you're going to have a really big error on how big your planet is, which means you don't really know if it's super Earth or mini Neptune. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Uh, or if it's gaseous or rocky uh, and everything that can follow from there. So this is going to essentially follow up on a bunch of interesting targets that it has selected and that um, its guest observers will select. Uh, it's gonna pinpoint the star size 
get the planet size. It's going to target a bunch of planets that'll be really great for RV follow-ups specifically. Radial uh, velocity follow-ups. Radial velocity yeah. follow-ups to get the masses of the planets, uh, to get an empirical mass radius relationship, to get planet densities, to start characterizing more in detail uh, and in a larger uh, quantity the atmospheres of planets, uh, both of the middling size and, and the hot Jupiters as well. Um, and it's going to essentially get a really good list for um, the large ground-based telescopes that are going to be coming online hopefully soon, and the telescope that must not be named because I don't want to get it delayed yeah. again. <laughs> That'll hopefully launch soon. Yeah. Uh, and so it'll be uh, a really great tiny but powerful work workhorse for mm -hmm. the exoplanet community where things like Tess and Kepler, they just like shove thousands of exoplanets at you and hope you get stuff out of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I did an interview earlier this week with David Kipping and we talked a bit about, about this problem that Tess and Kepler for sure, but now Tess is taking this to the next level mm -hmm. is, is pouring out transit candidates. It's a, fire hose of, of exoplanet yeah, candidates but they are you get one blip mm -hmm. and then you and then and then test moves on because it's got it's, it's got, got the whole more, sky it's to got do. the whole sky to look at and so yep. so the chances of you know if you know your plan the only planets it's going to be able to confirm within that within that 29 27 days mm -hmm. is whatever has passed in front of the star multiple times that you can then do a follow-up yeah but there's going to be mostly stuff that just go by once and then Tess has to move on, and then you've got exactly. this one detection. How yeah, are you going to follow up? And this is what chaos, chaos will be will a do. really great instrument for that sort of thing, exactly. Be and especially for the planets that we think might exist around more sun-like stars, G stars, and hotter K stars, uh, where the habitable zone is further out, the orbital period is a bit longer. You may Tess may have only gotten one transit. Um, maybe there was, a, maybe it's in the Kepler field, and there's a second transit in there or something. Uh, but the K ops will be really good for that kind of follow up for some uh, confirmation of really compelling targets, um, as well as just uh, hammering out a lot of the details of ones we already know about. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so when? That, I mean, that, so when does the launch? When does it go? So the launch window opens up uh, middle of October, so only a couple weeks from now. Oh, cool. uh, goes till middle of November. It's launching uh, on a Soyuz rocket from French Guiana. It'll be awesome. Um, and it has, I think, a mission lifetime of three and a half years, hopefully five years. Where's so it going? It's going, um, it's going in a excellent question. Thank you. Going in an or and it's going in some orbit where it can see the entirety of the sky. Right. But the exact orbital configuration escapes me. I typed chaos and the first thing that Google oh, suggested thanks. was the, was orbit. 700 okay. kilometer sun synchronous orbit. So sun it's synchronous not, orbit. Yeah, there so we go. It's not going to a Lagrange point. It's going to be going nope. to, it's just going to be doing a sun synchronous orbit. Yes. But it will be able to observe exoplanets across the entire sky. So really good for test follow up and for K2 follow up too. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. I'm, It'll be I'm, really awesome. I'm looking forward to it. That's um, not the one I'm most excited about. I mean, obviously, you know, there's James Webb. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say the word. I'm going to say the name. But the one uh, that I'm really excited about is Ariel, which launches in 2028. Yeah, Ariel is going to be really awesome. Ariel is the uh, atmospheric characterization yeah. uh, telescope. It's a it's an entire satellite just for characterizing exoplanet atmospheres. Um, I learned a heck of a lot about it at the Exoplanet Conference in Iceland a few weeks ago. Um, it's going to be really, really awesome. Yeah. Uh, at doing exoplanet atmospheres, yay! Yes. That's what I, I love. That too. Well, that's and that's what, what I mean. We saw how the internet went into a frenzy when water vapor was discovered in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet, thanks mm -hmm. to hard won observations by Hubble Space yeah. Telescope. And the the, the thing with uh, atmospheric characterization now, if you want to get down to a lot of the nitty gritty details, you're really pushing the most powerful telescope we have. Hubble to its very limits to do something it was never ever designed to do. Um, I know this very intricately because a good chunk of my thesis is on using Hubble to do these atmospheric I measurements. Guess we'll have to um, use stupid Hubble. It is super hard. Yeah. Um, even and if you add in um, um, the infrared telescope as well, it still gets super duper hard. It's it was never meant to detect these kinds of signals. You're lucky 
as we saw with the with the water vapor, you're lucky if you get one clear molecular signature. So do you probably going to be water? I mean, do you really feel like Europe is dominating the exoplanet space telescope exoplanet space? I mean, they've got that and they've got one other and I forget the name of it. There's a third Plato. 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 Yeah. Plato is going to happen, I think, in 2026, which is also going to be a transiting exoplanet satellite. Um, I mean, in terms of in the short term, they're certainly going to have quite a few telescopes up there, but we we definitely cannot discount TESS. Um, we can't, and we can't discount Kepler's continuing contribution uh, from data archives. And the telescope that must not be named should actually launch next uh, next year, two years from now, year and a half. Yeah, let's call it. But then you get the thank you for crossing your fingers. <laughs> the extremely, I might have jinxed it just a little bit. <laughs> then comes the extremely large telescope, which is going to do yeah, ground based we'll observations come, and direct observations. So, so I will note that for Kops, for Plato, for Ariel, they're all going to essentially be transiting satellites. Uh, I mean, um, satellites that detect transiting exoplanets. Um, when we get to an area, will be able to do atmospheres. James Webb will be able to do atmospheres as well. That'll be good. Um, and then after that is W first, which also has a huge micro lensing component. So that's a whole different population of exoplanets um, that none of the European missions that have been accepted can detect yet. So that's can't discount that, but it's also so far off. Yeah. Um, so. But it's good. I, I mean, I think yeah, people always ask I, me, like, are you, you know, do you feel like all the cool stuff's already happened? And then I just rattle no. off 10 oh, upcoming things. telescopes, you know, 20 upcoming telescopes that are coming up in the next yes. decade. And I'm, and I am you so excited. You can't forget when Bepi Colombo is going to get to Mercury. Yeah, Bola. I know. Parker Space, Parker's, yeah. Park Solar Park Probe. Park Solar yeah. Probe, there yeah, you go. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, no, all lots of exciting stuff. Cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, Boya, tell us about Venus. Hey, is this is this a good volume? You could always be yelling. You're you definitely okay, a little quiet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna yell. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we're just gonna go with it. Uh, so I also am an exoplanets fanatic. That's what I am working on for my thesis. I usually ignore the solar system, but I saw this story on Venus and got really excited. Um, one of my favorite things about Venus is that if we were looking at it from another solar system, it would look habitable. It's the right size. It's the same size as Earth. It, depending on your models, it could be in the habitable zone. Uh, but we here on Earth, because we've sent probes to Venus and we know what its atmosphere is like, we know it's not habitable now. Uh, so right now, Venus has, some people describe it as as the hell planet. It has a temperature, an average temperature above 850 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really hot. The atmosphere is super dense. Uh, it's mostly carbon dioxide and nitrogen. It's just, it's not a good place to live, not a good place for life. I but, would suggest uh, that it's like, it's so bad, we should just push it into the sun and be done with it. Right. It it's, it, it wouldn't make much of a difference. No, it, it's already it's so done. hot. It's dead. It's gone. Yeah, it's too hot. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's this new study that just came out. Um, actually, this team from NASA GIS, the Goddard Institute for Space Science, for space studies, uh, they just presented this research at the DPS meeting in Geneva, and uh, they they did some simulations that found that Venus actually might have been habitable uh, for a couple billion years if you go back as far as 700 million years. Um, so the the simulations they they simulated Venus with different topographical features. So they simulated a Venus covered in water, a Venus that actually just has uh, the same geographical formations as Earth, but uh, some thick oceans. And then Venus as it is now with the same surface, but with different thicknesses of oceans. And they ran that simulation forward uh, to see how the planet would evolve over time. And what they found was that probably about 700 million years ago, there was this big outgassing event on the planet. Uh, so outgassing means that something happened maybe it was that the sun eventually got got hot enough as it is increasing in temperature over its lifespan um, but something happened so that all of the rocks in venus's surface or core released enough carbon dioxide to kind of create a runaway greenhouse effect that over time created an, an inho inhospitable inhabitable uninhabitable both, both. 
<laughs> English is really yeah. hard. It created an atmosphere that wouldn't be able to support life. Uh, but before that, uh, there was a stable temperature range between like 70 degrees and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they don't know what created that outgassing event. They don't know what triggered it, but it did happen. And that's why Venus is a hell planet today. I, you know, one of the things that I found really fascinating about this paper was <clears throat> like the idea that like, you know, the, the surface of Venus today is completely uh, scrubbed clean. There's there are no big impact craters and that allows planetary scientists to know that that it did this resurfacing event within the last few hundred million years. And the assumption had always been that Venus had always sucked. And then it, it had done these resurfacing events at, you know, whatever random intervals that it had. But the simulation mm -hmm. showed that if it had never done a resurfacing, if it had never released that carbon dioxide for whatever reason that it did, it could even still be habitable today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that this is really interesting for people who want to study panspermia, the idea that life in our solar system started somewhere else and it was carried to Earth on a on a rock somehow. Uh, it's somehow transported from some other body to us. Uh, if Venus was habitable, billions of years ago, then, you know, maybe life formed there and maybe it came to Earth somehow. Um, I mean, that's that's like a, a possibility, right? But like the fact that this is now a possibility is really exciting. So what do you think that we can learn from, I mean, this is a really fantastic simulation, but what, you know, what can we learn about the habitability of Venus as we search for for other interesting exoplanets? Uh, well, we need to know, I think one of the things that the researchers in this study complained about was that we haven't sent probes to Venus in a, in a long time. I don't remember when the last one was, but well, Akatsuki's it's not there getting... right now from the Japanese. Okay. I think the last right. mission to land on Venus was in the seventies oh, and it was the Russians the, to yeah, land the on 80s, the surface yeah, of a probe into Venus. Yeah. 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 So it's not getting as much attention as these researchers would want it to get. And if we we can learn way more about Venus now that we have motivation to learn more about Venus and its surface and atmosphere and its history. Uh, it's interesting if you're looking at it through an exoplanet lens, because when we look at Venuses in other solar systems, when we look at planets that are slightly within the habitable, the habitable zone, uh, we, we almost immediately uh, dismiss them as uninhabitable. But I think that this, this Venus, this new Venus information can be a lesson in how we shouldn't immediately dismiss those planets. There are situations where those planets can be habitable for a really long time and remain stable long enough to support life. Yeah, well, that can yeah, become intelligent. So, so maybe we shouldn't be hating on Venus all the time, Fraser. <laughs> right, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> we shouldn't throw it into the sun, Fraser. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Well, now we can. Still, you know. But I think that. Like the when you look at the ha the habitable zone of of like the traditionally calculated habitable zone, it goes from 0.99 astronomical units to about 1.5 astronomical units, and the Earth mm -hmm. is right here at one astronomical unit. And so the traditionally yeah. measured habitable zone, thanks to Venus, thanks to terrible Venus, is maybe it's time to recalculate that because. It's well, kind of amazing how how much, you know, these simulations. And so the and the other thing that I just found mm -hmm. really interesting was was how important and this is sort of it goes into the the IPCC uh, release of the uh, current climate and the state of the oceans and the loss of the glaciers and all of this, how vital that ocean and atmosphere were would have been for regulating the heat, locking away the, the gases and keeping the temperature stable for a, just an enormous period of time. And it's when yeah. it lost that water, when it lost that that capability, then it just went to hell, literally. Yeah, it's it's a super timely finding. Uh, so one, yes, the, the oceans are really important. Uh, I'm almost hesitant to say this next thing because I don't want someone to grab a, a soundbite and use this to dismiss climate change. But it, <laughs> uh, it also is important to remember that the habitable zone around a star shifts as the star evolves. So billions of years ago, the habitable zone, the inner edge wasn't at 0.99 AU. 
the way it is today. It was closer to the sun. Uh, and as the sun grows older, it grows in size and it grows in temperature. Uh, and so the habitable zone gets pushed out. That is not what's happening with climate change. Very slowly. <laughs> it's very slow. It happens on like yeah. the, the billions of years time scales. Yeah, 500 million to a billion years before temperatures yeah. get too hot here on Earth. Yeah, yeah so not, not relevant to the climate change hundreds. discussion, but yeah. definitely relevant to the Venus discussion. Fantastic. All right, well then, okay. I think uh, we need to send a mission back to Venus Actually, I've been I'm a huge fan. We got to go back to Venus, especially <laughs> to land back on Venus. There's some really fascinating uh, ideas for rovers using some heat resistant electronics now mm. and even like clockwork rovers that have been proposed that could actually get down there and and move around on the surface of, of Venus. So that'd be I think so cool. It's, it's time to go back. Uh, Carolyn, tell us about the yes. black hole. Well, we can send Venus to it. Um. We send Venus, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like so it's already consuming various Venus. No, no hating on Venus. What is with this? <laughs> Come on. Yeah, just, we just agreed that Venus is cool. We just it's agreed cool that we again. should go yeah. back there. Come on, yeah, I was just, I was just in the moment. I needed yeah. a transition. Yeah. Um, yeah, so black holes. Well, I've been fascinated with them for a long time, and they've been this sort of thing that in my lifetime where they went from being sort of a mathematical curiosity or a physical, a physics problem to being something that we've actually been able to detect. So for example, when I was in graduate school, Hubble Space Telescope took what they called the smoking gun image of a black hole, uh, NGC 4261. It was a supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy. And of course today now we find them all over the place and they're implicated, at least the supermassive ones in, inside, you know, in a lot of processes inside galaxies. Um, they affect star formation rates. They, uh, in, barred, in some barred spiral galaxies, you get this phenomenon of the bar feeding material into the central region of the black hole from the outer part of the galaxy. And in other places, like in our own galaxy, we have this black hole that's just feeding from things, material that's right nearby. So astronomers are kind of interested in a lot of things about black holes, including how they grow and what their relationship is with their galaxies. And then, of course, recently we've seen them, you know, colliding neutron stars and black holes colliding and creating gravitational waves. Um, but there was a story, and there was a story released today about three black holes colliding in the center of a, of a three galaxy collision. So the news just continues to roll on. Um, but the story that, I, that really caught my attention this last few days was um, the black hole at the center of our own galaxy seems to have brightened up the region around it in the last, <clears throat> earlier this year. Now the region is called Sagittarius A star for those of you who don't know about it and it's being studied very heavily by a lot of astronomers. I believe the Event Horizon Telescope people are trying to measure yep. it uh, now and we're, hopefully we'll be see something about that. Well, we know that this black hole is really quiescent most of the time. Um, it doesn't have a jet you know, that we know of like, like, like M87 does. Um, it doesn't seem to have a lot of really high level activity, but occasionally it munches down some material that happens to get nearby. And when that happens, the region around the black hole, you, you know, just outside of the event horizon brightens up at various wavelengths. So that's what happened. And earlier this year, astronomer Andrea Gez from UCLA and a group of people found evidence for Sag A star snacking on something. And they saw this in a group of images that they were going through and analyzing. And to kind of make a long story short, they've gone through about 13,000 observations, made over 133 nights of telescope time. This is both using the Keck uh, telescope in Hawaii and the Very Large Telescope in Chile. Now in April and May this year, the region right around the event horizon, this point of no return where things pass over and they never come back, appeared to be quite bright, particularly in the infrared. And it was about twice as bright as any of the previous observations that they'd seen. So the big question was what's happening? And these brightenings were really, really quite out of the norm. So they came up with a few ideas about what they think could be happening. Um, blobs of gas falling in, where would those be coming from? Um, and they get drawn into the black hole and they start to glow because of friction, because of magnetic heating. And that's what showed up in those infrared observations. And infrared is important because our heart, the, the region of the black hole is really surrounded by these clouds of gas and dust. You don't see a lot of visible light coming through, you can get radio signals through, you can get infrared, you can see a little x-ray. So this is what they were looking at. One candidate that they had for this was a, an object called S02, which is a star, and it probably could have lost a great deal of gas as it was speeding past 
Sagittarius A star during its orbit. And that material could have been, you know, contacted the event horizon and gotten heated, and that's what we saw. There's also a sort of a cloudy object called G2, which astronomers think might actually be a pair of binary stars. Um, and they periodically make close approaches to the inner region of Sagittarius A star. Not close enough to get sucked in, but right. they lose some material. But like comets. Like it, I, when well, you think about the stars acting like comets as they go yeah, around yeah. this black you hole. You see this material stretched out, yeah. And so um, the gravitational pull is really the story here. And, and you know, there's this stuff going on. There's also a lot of stars and objects rotating around the center of the, or, or up orbiting the center of the black hole. So people are tracking that quite a bit. But there is a third possibility, which was sort of at the bottom of the story that they sent me, which involves swarms of asteroids that have gotten too close to the event horizon and they get sucked in and and get heat, superheated. And that's what causes this glow. So sort of the upshot here is that they're not really sure what's causing it, but they do see that our, our Sagittarius A star is growing. It is eating. It's not growing very fast, but it, but it is eating. But it's not as active as some of the really bright AGN uh, supermassive black holes that we see. Carolyn, right. do we have any idea based on how much brighter it got, how much mass it actually ate? Yeah, there wasn't anything in there, and I'm still looking for that. I, I don't really know. They, they basically characterize it as sort of a cloud of gas, and what the mass of that would be, I, I haven't been able to find yet. Yeah, I, Andrew Gez is uh, just like is the one of the m most my favorite interviews. I've talked to her yeah. a couple of times now. So knowledgeable, um, and and when I talked to her, it must have been like six, seven years ago. They were seeing some of these things inbound, and they weren't sure what they were and what impl you know the yeah. implications were going to be as it interacted with the supermassive black hole. And now we're, you know, the, the number of observations are not only seeing some of these what seem like stars, maybe they're balls of gas, maybe, as you said, they're clouds of asteroids, yeah. but but they are getting a chance to watch even more interaction. So it's so I mean, is it starting to blur the line between what is an active like what is an active galaxy and what is a a, a supermassive black hole that's just gobbling I, I, snacks? Well, for, for Sag A star, I I. I don't know. I mean, yeah. you would think that it would, it, it might be, but you, you compare it to like, you know, the, the, the black hole at the center of M87, which is just massive, way more massive than ours. And there's a huge difference. Um, I think the bigger story really here is that we're still trying to characterize how this black hole is growing and eating in the center of our galaxy. You know, as I said, we have some black holes that collide with each other and that makes really large, that's sort of a orders of magnitude different from what's happening at the center of our galaxy. Um, so I think, Basically, what they're trying to do is just characterize what's happening at the center of our own galaxy and what's eating. And this G2 cloud that, or this G2 object has been, a, you know, a center of interest for at least a decade or more that I know of. And people have been trying to characterize it and they've, you know, charted its orbit and that sort of thing. If it's a star losing mass, it's going to have to be quite a bit of mass to see that kind of brightening. But I just, I'm sorry, I don't know the Yeah, no, no, it's, that. it's kind yeah. of a, I mean, even fairly small events when they happen, when they crash into the supernova, they do release a pretty bright flash of gamma radiation that's detectable yeah. here. So yeah. it's actually quite impressive how sensitive the black hole is, you know, when it eats, it's a very messy eater all the time. And, yeah, and, yeah. and so uh, astronomers here are able to see in various wavelengths as these, as these different uh, meals, these snacks meals are, are consumed. And it tells yeah, and Andrea us a lot said it was kind of like, around it. yeah. And, and Andrea actually said, you know, in there, you know, they hadn't really seen it brighten like this for a couple of decades. So I mean, this had to be pretty, pretty big and pretty obvious for that to yeah. happen. Of course, they're, they're doing archaeology on this. They're going back through a lot of older images to, to see if this has been happening, yeah. you know, before this. And of course, you, you can only go back so far, and then we're really just going to have to start observing it again and, and monitoring it closely to see if it continues to do this. You know, are there other things that are coming up in, in orbit that might actually also get yeah. material stripped away and yeah. sucked into the event horizon? Uh, but it's very far away. Don't worry about it. It's 26,000 no, light years yeah. away. So it's not going to impact us in any way, shape, or form ever. We can see it. We just, it's not going to yeah. hurt us. Yeah, with yeah. the most powerful telescopes on Earth making thousands of observations. All right, so I'm going to take a second right. now and and talk. There's two things. One thing that I want to sort of remind everybody and get everybody prepared for, and that is that SpaceX is uh, wrapping up 
working on announcing uh, the next stage of the Star Hopper prototype. This is, of course, the scaled down version of their Starship, which is going to be carrying humans to Mars, which I'll be talking about in a second. Um, but we saw the tests of the Star Hopper uh, a few weeks back, and now the new prototypes are, are getting ready. Uh, one just got its big wings assigned. It's got some really interesting different uh, designs from the original prototypes. You know, all of the the artist illustrations that we've been using are, are of no use anymore because they just keep making them different. Um, and so the latest thing that they've got is they've got these two big wings. And I want to just show you uh, what this looks like. But Elon Musk has announced that he's going to be giving a an update to everybody uh, on Saturday. So just in a couple of days, we're going to hear more. So I'm just going to share with you. Yeah. Uh, these twin wings. So I'll share this with the rest of the team as well. All right, so you guys can see this. So it's got these twin, these two wings at the bottom of the of the rocket. And originally, the expectation was, you know, all of the artist illustrations have these three wings, and now it's just two on either side. And so the uh, Musk has described that these are going to uh, assist with takeoff and landing, and they're actually going to be able to kind of flap back and forth and move up and down depending on how the rocket needs them for returning into the into the atmosphere and for being able to to do its landing. So um, we're still kind of waiting on exactly what this is going to. There you go. So Grant Landing says air brakes, and I think that's a that's a much better. They're gonna they're gonna move quite a bit more than. Um, then I think, uh, you know, people expect, uh, wings on the side of a rocket to do. So that's, that's kind of the first, uh, piece of information. And the, why this is relevant, of course, is, uh, the plan for the starship is to be the spacecraft that carries, um, that supports a colony of 1 million human beings on the surface of Mars. And so, you know, while Elon Musk is focused with uh, I'm going to just take human beings to Mars and roll them out onto the surface and however it's up to them to survive. Uh, other people are starting to think about what are the implications? What are the details about what it might take to live on Mars, especially what is everybody going to eat? So in the latest episode, latest uh, journal, oh, what's the journal called? Space? News, New Space, that's it. In the journal New Space, uh, a team of researchers wrote a journal article called How to Feed a Million Martians, uh, Feeding a Million Martians. And they describe, essentially, they run simulations for, for what it will take to actually, based on the amount of calories that a human being wants, based on the fact that humans are going to be born and die on the surface of Mars, uh, hopefully not in an accelerated way, that, uh, you know, based on the new technologies with hydroponics and LED lighting and and various things, is it possible for the Martians to be able to feed themselves? And if it's not, then you need to send 200,000 starships to Mars with all the food on board to be able to feed them for 100 years, which is how long Musk expects it to take for a self-sustaining colony of 1 million people. Um, but if the Martians can utilize a lot of the technology that is uh, at their disposal, like hydroponics, LED lights, things like that, they can build 14,000 kilometers of tunnels, uh, four, four meters across, and grow food inside of them, 46 square meters per person, uh, 40 six million square meters, 46,000 kilometers, square kilometers of terrain um, uh, being used for growing food. Uh, and in, but according to their calculations, if they get going fast, it, within the first five Martian years, 10 Earth years, the Martians should be able to grow the vast majority of their food. In fact, one boring a uh, tunneling machine uh, should be capable of tunneling 40, 14,000 kilometers of tunnels, uh, keeping ahead of their pace of all of the new people that are arriving on Mars and all the new mouths to feed. So that problem has been solved. Yeah, totally. Did 64 square meters of, of 46. gardens. Yeah, 46, 46. Square, square meters yeah. of garden per colonist. Person, per colonist. That's what per, you require yeah, okay. of hydroponics. Sure. Uh, 
as as someone who had a nine square meter garden this summer that took up all of my free time, how are these colonists going to do literally anything else but try and feed themselves? Well, so so it depends if they want to do anything but feed themselves. So so so, yeah. so, they, so they anything but like yeah. you know uh, yeah. ma maintenance yeah whatever for example you know or... anything entertainment anything no so so they actually ran through a bunch of the numbers and they said you know if if they're fairly leisurely about it and take say seventy five years to get their infrastructure set up or the full hundred years that it actually won't take that much of their time. But if, but if the Martian colonists, if all they do is farm and all of the ships that come from earth, all of the cargo ships from earth are bringing hydroponics and electronics and led grow lights and seeds and all of that stuff, then they could do it within about 10 years. And they proposed a more reasonable say, 50 years to kind of ramp up production of food production on on mars now they didn't that would go be into, interesting to oh, go ahead oh, oh i was gonna say they didn't go into like you know what kind of solar plants it would take to be able to generate the power to be able to produce the grow lights but you know and the warmth and yeah. the warmth yeah. Yeah. yeah well i mean you dig underground you're gonna live underground anyway so um but I think it's it's at least it is theoretically possible to be able to feed all those people. So, so at this point, there's no reason to to turn them back. How much will that cost? Oh well, it doesn't matter, right? People will pay for there's their. There's no tickets. money on Mars. It doesn't matter. Yeah, they'll pay for the. Yeah, yeah. What, what does money mean on Mars, right? They'll Mars bucks. Yeah, the Mar yeah, They'll pay with Mars bucks. Right? Yeah, it's kind of like um, Bitcoin, but with Mars. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Did did this report list the like the optimal foods like the optimal yes it seeds did that they yeah would bring? yeah so there's two parts to this so they recommended um, they didn't list specifically the plants but they talked about you know there's a lot of really good energy dense plants uh, Kimberly I know you did an article uh, last well, year. See, I did an article but about planting in the Martian in, soil not yeah. about hydroponics yeah. um, so in terms of planting in the Martian soil. Um, there have been a number of experiments done where uh, people have replicated what it would be like to actually plant on Mars using um, Mar simulated Mars soil of the right composition and density and texture and such. Potatoes do work. So yep. good job. Good job with that, Martian. Um, then a lot of like den like iron greens, you know, Mars iron stuff. Um, hops for your beer. Yeah. Uh, marijuana, if it's legal there. And I don't know. barley. It and would barley. definitely be legal on Mars. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Elon, yeah. It's Elon Musk. Obviously. Yeah. Don't tell me yeah. we're going to have kale yeah. on Mars. Kale on Mars. Oh, yeah. yeah, kale was great. <laughs> kale, beer, and weed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, Interesting call. But then yeah. the other thing is they said is like, where are you going to get your protein from? And so they recommended crickets, mm -hmm. uh, cricket protein that's that, good. you know, obviously you're not going to be that's able fair. to have cattle and chickens and things like that. But they said well, that. Well, that's really helpful because then you can turn it into flour. Yes. Like crickets are, yeah. are useful for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, and you can farm them in a really tight area and you can have these vertical farms of crickets and you feed them various kinds of plants and they turn into protein in a, in a ratio that's roughly the same as, mm -hmm. as uh, still want to live on Mars. Um, so, uh, so the, uh, but, and then the other thing they recommended is sort of as the costs of cultured proteins of essentially meat that is made without an animal comes down we get to this point where they have bioreactors that are producing various cultured meats you know chicken beef but rhinoceros and sea otter and whatever you want to eat um hmm. because it's never been near an animal you can have big, all kinds of exotic uh, i meats. hope no one wants to eat a rhinoceros well it's not real it's not real so yeah it's, it's, i would eat a fake rhinoceros yeah, i would so but yeah. not crickets. i would still get the guilt oh even no though it's, it's not real it never was <laughs> near an animal so um but so the uh, but the 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 real takeaway that I that I liked about this so they have a website that's attached called Eat Like a Martian. You can actually go there and they recommend the diet that that if you if you want to eat like a Martian today, if you want to prepare yourself, if you're planning to go to Mars, you can prepare yourself and start to eat this way today. And it's a it's a great food for just having a low impact on the planet. So it's you know mostly plants. Uh, very very sustainable protein sources, and uh, it you know it gets us thinking about the kinds of food you know if you if you're trying to 
absolutely minimize your impact on the environment and try to survive with the with a closed environment in a very tight space, you think a lot about these things. And these are the kinds of thoughts that we should be having about just the earth itself. So actually, sort of you go through the whole process, it actually makes me think a lot about about just how we need to change the way we eat here on earth. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so Nancy just put a link into it go to eat like a martian.org. They've got a free uh, workbook you can download that will give you all of the advice and uh, and you can go from there. Carolyn, you're on my screen. Where can people find out more and what are you what are you working on? Right now I'm working on some exhibit projects uh, for astronomy. And mostly you can see what I write on the spacewriter.com slash WP. Perfect. And, and of course, if you ever go to planetariums, a lot of my shows are out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I have several books out. There's a lot of things. So, yeah. <laughs> Kimberly, what are you working on? Oh, well, I've spent uh, the past couple of weeks recovering from a trip to Iceland, learning all about exoplanets. This is the most exoplanet thing I've done in a couple of years. How did you um, like Iceland? So well, that was just epically awesome. Yeah. Um, such a gorgeous country, such varied geology and, and nature. And I think they have every form of water that can possibly be stable on the surface of, of the planet, all in this one island. So I saw all of them, Yeah. Uh, which is pretty awesome, including a glacier yeah. for the first time. Yes. Um, and so after that, um, I've been working on a, a longer article about the new field of Martian seismology that we've been getting uh, because of Insight and its seismometer. So, so you made a note on Twitter that you were talking about yeah. a Mars quake, and I didn't see this anywhere. So where? You didn't, you, really? Did, so I swear I talked about it on the Weekly Space Hangout back in April. Yeah, but, um, but the like, detection like, of the first Mars quake happened uh, in April of yeah, this but, year. But wasn't it with the wrong instrument? Like, it was not. It was with the seismometer. Okay. They got it. Okay. It, okay. It, it's distinctly a Mars quake. So, but there it's wasn't not, like you know, a vibrations from the wind or anything. There was a second one that happened, I think, in July. There was a, a second Mars quake okay. that they um, released information on. It was a very different sort of quake in terms of the strength and the depth that they think that it came from. So the shaking motion was quite different. Okay. Food for thought. Yeah. Um, and they've just been. I, I spoke with a lot of the the scientists on the on the insight team like you said excellent interviews i've learned so much about mars and seismicity and you should uh look for that in a couple weeks on eos.org perfect moya what are you working on i am preparing for all of my upcoming caveat shows so starting next week i'm gonna be a weekly guest on a comedy show which is new and exciting for me uh i'm batch preparing a bunch of presentations ahead of time and I am working on putting together a sample episode for the show that I'll be hosting starting next year at Caveat where I combine astronomy and fictional world building and improv storytelling all in one. So that's what I'm working on now. And where can people go if they want to f follow what you're doing? You can find me on Twitter at GoAstroMo. Perfect. All right, and uh, if it sounded like I knew a lot about uh, the growing food on Mars, that's because that's what my next episode uh, on the Guide to Space is all about. So that'll be uh, showing up on Friday. All right, I'm going to put everyone back on the screen. There we all are. Uh, thanks, guys, for uh, helping me explain the space news this week. Thank you to our special guests. Thanks, of course, to our moderators and good friends of the Weekly Space Hangout crew. We couldn't do this without you. Thanks, everyone, watching. Uh, we will see all of you right here next week. Bye. Bye. How do I turn this off? Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I hid the window. All right. I'm gonna now. Now it's goodbye. See you later. <laughs>